Hello and welcome to Mana Church High Point's online message. We are so excited that you've decided to join us today and are letting us be a part of your life. My name is Jacob Lindsay and I'm the creative director here at Mana Church. Now before we get started into this powerful and life-changing new series, I want to let you know a couple things. First, uh, Pastor Jeff and Anna are out of town right now. They're on vacation taking some much needed rest. So if we as a church, just make sure to be praying for them as they're going from place to place. But I also want to encourage you to comment on this video. Whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, we want to hear from you and we want to know how God is impacting your life through these messages. Today we're launching a new series called Guardrails. We're borrowing this series if you will, from a pastor named Andy Stanley of North Point Community Church. And if you've been here for a couple of years, you probably know at this point that we have actually done this kind of sermon series before. This is not our first time doing this, but it was powerful the first time that we did it, and it's going to be powerful this time. And I'm super excited to be blessed with the privilege of bringing you the first message of this series. Now, this series is called Guardrails, and everyone knows what guardrails are down to the last elementary schooler, but you might not know the technical definition. I doubt most of us have ever just, you know, checked the Webster's Dictionary uh, definition of guardrails, but we're actually going to get there in just a little bit. And by the way, for you intellectual grammar folks, uh, who may sort of be a little bit anal about how we're stylizing this. We're stylizing it mostly as one word, but it can be used as two. Guardrails can be one word, or it can be two words. And um, the Occupational Safety and Health, the Ad Health Administration uses guardrails as one word, not two. So if you're an American, we're justified in stylizing it as one, but um, that's neither here nor there. We all know what a guardrail is. Our definition, though, is a system designed to keep vehicles from straying into dangerous or off-limit areas. The interesting thing about guardrails is that we don't really pay too much attention to them. We don't pay too much attention to them until we hit them. And we see them on the side of the road, but we don't really pay them any mind. Someone had to pay them mind, though. Someone had to put them there. Someone had to build that thing and put it in the ground. But why? Well, to keep vehicles from straying into dangerous or off-limit areas. And that's where you'll find them. Guardrails are out there on many, many stretches of road guarding potentially dangerous areas of the road. The three most common guardrails you'll see are at bridges, where there's little room for error. Because the danger of going off a bridge is pretty extreme. And anyone who values their life or their vehicle doesn't want to go off a bridge. The powers that be are aware of this. And so they put up these guardrails to keep you from turning your car into a big airborne missile. They'll put these guardrails at medians to protect you from oncoming traffic. When I was first learning to drive, my dad would always tell me, you know, you want to stay in the middle of your lane, but if you have to stray either to the left or to the right of your lane, you would rather stray to the right. Because even though going off-road is not that great of a thing, it's better than a head-on collision with someone on the other side who's going just as fast as you are, if not faster. Especially, we see these guardrails on highways, you know, because if Jacob is driving 60 miles per hour east and Zeke is driving 60 miles per hour west, well, you don't need to be a mathematician to figure out that we have a problem if the destination is each other's vehicle. They'll also put these guardrails at soft shoulders and curves, places where we have an unexpected change in steering. And it's no secret, and you know this, that people will drift off or just stop paying attention to the road. So when we come across one of these sharp torn turns or curves, it's always a good idea to have guardrails there. So guardrails do two things. They direct and protect. There is something else interesting about the placement of guardrails because generally speaking, they're not placed in the actual zones of danger. 
Guardrails aren't placed off of a bridge, you know. They're not placed past the median and into oncoming traffic. They're not placed in the ditch. They're placed before the ditch. They are placed just inside the danger zones, and the actual danger zones are just beyond the guardrails. So if there were no guardrails on bridges, you could theoretically drive closer to the bridge the end of that bridge, and you'd be fine. You could really live a life on the edge, so to speak. You could have the time of your life, perhaps the last time of your life, but the time of your life nonetheless. And you see, no one argues with the logic of placing guardrails outside of the danger zone. That would be foolish. It would defeat the purpose. You know, you've never heard anyone say, in your life, I guarantee you, You've never heard anyone say, blast these confounded guardrails. If they were only inside the mountain, I would be able to cut these corners with greater efficiency. Nobody complains about where the powers that be place these guardrails. I don't know, though. Maybe you can prove me wrong. For the most part, these guardrails are harmless, and we accept them as a normal part of our lives because we make an assumption. The assumption is that the damage from hitting the guardrail is less than the damage we would have received if that guardrail wasn't there at all. Now, it might seem ridiculous that I've been talking about guardrails for almost seven minutes now, but, you know, most people never think twice about them, and so that's why we're doing this. They just do their best to avoid slamming their car into them. But this is important, because it's time to get our minds off the road and onto our tumultuous lives. For the next several weeks, we are going to talk about establishing guardrails in various arenas of our lives, guardrails that are so strong and established that when we bump against them, they bother our conscience. We take these physical guardrails for granted, and we do that because someone else placed them there. But throughout this introduction, I've used this delegation the powers that be, and these workers, planners, and architects have placed guardrails in places because it's their job. There are no such workers when it comes to our spiritual walk. You are the worker. You are the creator. You are the architect of your own guardrails. And the goal with this series is to help you develop guardrails in your life that are so strong, once again, that when you bump up against them, it bothers your conscience. And the reason this series is so important is because if we're being honest, your greatest regrets probably could have been avoided if you had some guardrails in place for your health, maybe even for your time. And if you think of it in terms of driving, that ditch that you went into, that cliff that you flew off relationally, however you wish to describe it, your greatest regret could probably and would probably have been avoided if you had some guardrails financially, morally, relationally, in your marriage, in your parenting, in your whole perspective on authority, whatever it might be. But if we're not talking about guardrails anymore, physical ones, but instead spiritual ones, we need a new definition. So here's our spiritual definition for guardrails. It's this. Your personal standard of behavior, that's capital your, personal standard of behavior that becomes a matter of conscience. A personal standard of behavior that becomes a matter of conscience. Now the real reason I say a matter of conscience is this. In driving, as I said before, the whole idea of a guardrail is that there's some damage when you hit the guardrail, but it's better than what you would have dealt with if the guardrail wasn't there. So what we need to develop are standards of behavior or behavioral practices that you are so committed to as an individual that when we violate them, it bothers us. You know, that we would feel guilty and that our guilt level would be so associated with these guardrails that you've established in your life, whatever area of your life that may be, that these would be like personal guardrails and they're, listen, they're not for everybody. They're for you. 
And that's what we mean when we talk about this. It's a personal decision you'll make as it relates to your marriage, a personal decision as it relates to your finances, a personal decision as it relates to your friendships and how you conduct yourself and dating and all of that, a personal decision that informs or ignites your conscience. The interesting thing, though, and the challenging thing for us is that no one can build your guardrail but you. You hear what other people have to say. You can adopt other people's guardrails. You can go, oh, Jacob, that's a great idea. I think I'll do that too. But no one else can do it for you. Only you can create your own guardrails. And as a matter of fact, we can't even look at culture and society and social norms to try to help us create these guardrails because the uniquely challenging thing here is that culture doesn't promote guardrails. When we go to culture for advice, we're met with empty platitudes and suggestions. Culture is content with a painted line. And painted lines are fine. But there are areas of your life where we need a little bit more than a thinly painted white or yellow line. I don't know if you've noticed, but people tend to cross these lines all the time. I mean, of course you've noticed we drive on the same roads. I don't need to explain how people do this, but... We should talk about the lines that our culture has given us that even we as Christians will routinely drift past. How about alcohol? We're told to, our culture tells us to drink responsibly. A great suggestion. I think everyone can agree that we shouldn't drink irresponsibly. It's not a guardrail. It's a thin white line And it's a line that most people who drink can admit they've crossed before. Problem is, most of us know that line is there, but at some point we all inch our way up to it and we stop to care. We we stop and we we don't really care. We just kind of inch our way up to it. And before you know it, swoosh off the bridge in the danger zone. Or what about sex? We talk about young people, young adults, you know, middle schoolers, high schoolers, college students, that very wide and general age range. Our culture wants to tell them when it's appropriate for them to have sex. And that's a nice and good thing to do. As a culture, as a society, we should care about when people have sex. But what does culture say? They say, wait until you are ready. And I, I like to imagine this conversation, you know, are you ready? Well, well, I think so. Well, baby, I was born ready, you know? I mean, and if you keep thinking about this conversation, it, it just kind of makes me, <laughs> makes me laugh. You know, this idea of, well, when, when do you think you'll be ready? Uh, well, you know, I might be ready in, in three weeks. Okay, well, let's pencil that in. Today is uh, uh, February, February 5th. Okay, so three weeks. All right, let's go ahead and put that in because when you're ready, I know I'm going to be ready. I was born ready. So whenever we're ready, we'll be ready, you know? And maybe this isn't funny to you. Maybe you don't find me making light of this all that funny, but that's exactly what we're talking about. These kinds of platitudes are not enough to live a life in line with God's word. They're not enough even to just protect ourselves. Saying something like, oh, you know, wait till you're ready is about, is about as useful as a thin white line painted in a mountain, a curvy road up on the mountains. You know, again, how do you know? How do you know when you're ready? How do you know what drinking responsibly is? These aren't terrible ideas. They're good suggestions. What I'm saying is that we need to talk about something bigger, and that's what this series is. Let's do one more. This is fun for me, these examples. Parents, we tell parents, talk to your kids about drugs. And I hope that'll do some good. I can just picture it now. But I talked to my kids about drugs. Why are they doing them? Or how about this? I mean, all three of my kids are doing drugs right now. But I I mean, I talked to them. And that's a conversation. And conversations are great. And you should probably talk to your kids about drugs. But just talking to them isn't setting up a guardrail. Conversations are like those dotted lines in the middle of the road. You know, the ones that let you know that you can pass through them. 
That's what conversations are like. You know, whenever you're talking to someone and you're trying to give them advice and they just go, oh, that's great, and they kind of stay on one side of your advice sometimes and they just kind of go past it and ignore it. You know, people who your advice goes in one ear and right out the other, you know, maybe do more than talk to your kids about drugs. And that's what this series is about. The problem is our culture really likes these lines, but they're not a huge fan of guardrails. They don't promote them. They promote platitudes instead. And lots of people will get aggravated with Christians about these rules. Oh, these dumb rules, these dumb guardrails. I'd like to take a hard left turn. The reason why Christian rules get such a bad rep is because we as Christians, sometimes, not all of us, but many of us, will find times where we choose to get out of our own lane and try to build up a guardrail in someone else's lane. Now, I want you to just take this analogy further. What happens when we take our own guardrails and try to place them in someone else's lane? We get hit by a car. And that's not much good for anybody. The problem is, is that we try to apply uh, Christian values and biblical principles to people who don't know Jesus and people who don't know the Bible. It's not much good for anyone. And look, I'm making lots of jokes, and the fact of the matter is that this is a serious issue because culture gives us lines, but these lines don't ignite our conscience. They don't alert our conscience. And if you've ever crossed a line on the road, you know it's pretty easy to do. And there's nothing that tells you that unless maybe you hit a rumble strip, but lines don't alert us to danger. They don't impact our conscience. But smacking into a guardrail sure lets us know that we're not where we're supposed to be. This is not a new idea. It's something talked about throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. I mean, they use different language, obviously. You know, most people walked or rode camels or chariots. They weren't driving 70 miles per hour down the freeway. But what I want you to do is I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 5. And we're going to read four verses today. And that's it. So if you have a Bible, you know, some people have different versions. We only got one verse to go through. You might as well turn in it, turn to it in your Bible. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 18. And Paul is writing to the, to the Ephesians, letting them know um, and trying to encourage them in some of the things that they're going through. Their culture was full of sexual immorality, things that would make even people by today's standards kind of shudder. You know, it was normal practice and even spiritual practices to cheat on your spouse. Um, marriage wrecking was normal. You know, greed was normal. And so we're going to look at these four verses and what Paul is telling them in response to what their culture looks like. We've talked about what our culture looks like empty platitudes and suggestions. Perhaps what Paul says to the Ephesians can apply to us as well. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 15 says, look carefully then how you walk. Now that word then is there because Paul has been addressing several other things, sexual immorality, crude talk, covetousness, and idolatry. And he tells us to be careful, which really just means not to be careless. I, I've said this in a couple of different sermons. One of the best ways you can learn about what a word means is to also learn the definition of the word's opposite. So if we're going to talk about being careful, what does it mean to be careless? It means, you know, man, I could really care less. That's what it means. Now, I'm pretty lazy as a person. It's something that I'm struggling with praying through. Uh, but when I walk my dog... I will typically clean up his messes, you know? Except in this one specific area of my yard, behind the barn, which is a place that only normally me and my dog go to. But I'll leave it there and just kind of go back into the house. But you'd better believe that when I go behind that barn, I'm very, very careful about where I step because I know that there are landmines everywhere that seek to ruin my shoes. That's what careful means. Look around, 
Keep your eyes wide open. Pay attention. He says to look around, look ahead, look back. This is the posture Paul encourages us to adapt. Look around, look ahead, look behind you. Be wary, be sober, be vigilant. And Paul doesn't stop there. Verse 15 continues to say this. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. This means to have your eyes wide open. And in verse 16, he says, making the most of every opportunity. Now just stop there for a second because this means to redeem your time. And as we get older, and I know some of y'all are listening and you're kind of laughing at me. I know, I'm young, I'm 25. But even being 25, there are minutes, hours, days, weeks, even years wasted on bad relationships, on bad habits, doing things that I wish I could take back. And sometimes I just wish to myself, you know, if only I could go back, if I could just take back some of that time. You know, and this guardrails is how we avoid doing this in the future. I I don't want to look back. I want to look forward. And I want the rest of my time to be spent well. That's why we have guardrails. Paul continues to say, because the days are evil. And he's right. He was right back then. He's right now. We live in dangerous times. There is too much at stake for us to walk around the yard with our eyes closed. These are some nice shoes. You got some nice shoes. Don't ruin them. No, there's too much at stake. The days are evil. Our time is short. If we want to make the most of the time that we have here, we need to be careful, not careless, with where we step. We need to watch the road closely. And we need to make sure there are guardrails to keep us from flying off the bridge. There's simply too much at stake. And I'm talking a lot right now, but wouldn't you agree... These are dangerous times, financially, morally, maritally, professionally. If we don't pay attention, we might find ourselves in the middle of a financial crisis. If we don't have guardrails set up in our business practices, our social interactions, and our overall integrity of heart and disposition, well, how do you think those people end up on the news? How do you think people end up on the news having done these horrible, degenerate things? Sure, maybe some of them are just bad apples. Maybe they just aren't quite right. But I think that most people who find themselves on the opposite end of a scandal just weren't careful. They didn't have guardrails to keep them from doing the things that they knew they shouldn't have done, and they take a nosedive right off the metaphorical bridge. Maybe they're walking their dog at night without a flashlight. Not a good idea, trust me. The point is that hardly anyone ever sees it coming. That's the thing about pride. It comes before a fall. And that's the thing about falling. If you knew you were gonna fall, you wouldn't have fallen. Verse 17, he says, therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And what Paul is telling us here is that we need to face up to the will of the Lord. Quit deceiving yourself. You know, if you follow God for any amount of time, you know this, that one of the best ways that you can understand God's will is to open the Bible. Open it, read it. It's incredible the amount of just actually good life advice you can get from this book. If for no other reason, open the book because if you're struggling with something, someone in the Bible has struggled with exactly what you're struggling through. And here's the crazy thing, you can either learn from their failure or you can learn from their example because both things are in there. 
And God is speaking through the Bible. It is a living and active word, sharper than any two-edged sword. So if you are trying to know God's will and understand his will, as Paul just recommended we do, open the Bible. Because your heart needs to be examined by the Spirit of God. And the question we should all be asking ourselves right now when we're talking about danger zones and and we're talking about foolishness and being careful where we walk, the question we should be asking ourselves is where? Where are you flirting with disaster? How are you entertaining foolishness? When was the last time your mouth really almost got you into trouble? When was the last time you deliberately put yourself in the way of temptation? What is something right now that you are justifying to yourself that you know is unjustifiable? What kinds of games are you playing to get just a little more satisfaction? How are you sacrificing your integrity on the altar of feeling good? You know, Only you know. Only you know the places that you're dancing on the edge of disaster. And I hope your conscience is talking. I hope the Holy Spirit is talking to us all right now. Are we over the line? Should there have been a guardrail in this unexpected turn? I think we're all ready and that we've already had some near misses. Come on. It's time to wake up. I've talked about a lot of categories. Marriage, relationships, drugs, finances, and business. But I want to give you a very specific example. Actually, Paul wants to give us a very specific example of some practical guardrails. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. This is our last verse. says, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Now, before I tell you what those words mean, I want you to hear what he's saying. According to Paul, the problem is not the getting drunk part. It's the debauchery. It's what getting drunk leads to, and it leads to debauchery. Being drunk is the guardrail. It's not quite the danger zone, but it's close. Hitting it should be a problem. If we're following the logic of these guardrails, when you hit this one, there should be an alarm going off in your head. Your conscience should be alerted. And you should realize, I'm on the edge of disaster. I'm on the edge of something bad. I'm about to run off. And by the way, this isn't me talking. This is the Bible. This is Paul. This is God. This is the word of the Lord canonized in Scripture that God has faithfully delivered to his people for reproof, correction, and edification. The problem that we deal with, many of us, is that for some of us, hitting that guardrail is the highlight of our night. It's the highlight of our week. Hitting that guardrail is actually our goal. But it should be setting something off in our hearts and alerting our minds that we're flirting with disaster. For some of us, getting drunk is a nightmare and an addiction. For others still, it's about to be. We're not there yet, but one day we find ourselves there. The thing is, no one ever sets out with the mission of becoming an alcoholic. No one wakes up one day and decides, this is my new thing. It's a process of running past white and yellow lines where guardrails should be, and then one day we decide that we'd rather just drive off-road full-time. Because how on earth am I going to find my way back to the road? Then one day, you know, we wake up. It's not just unhealthy behaviors, it's who we've chosen to be. It doesn't happen overnight. Sometimes it takes a lifetime. Sometimes it takes a year. But it's funny. How long will let the enemy backseat drive for us? before we eventually just pull over and go like, hey man, can you drive for a bit so I can take a nap in the back? And so I know probably many of you are wondering this question. 
Some of you are thinking, is he going to say that getting drunk is a sin? Oh, I hope he says that getting drunk is a sin. Others of you are thinking, is he saying that getting drunk is a sin? I hope he doesn't say that getting drunk is a sin. And that's the question. Is getting drunk a sin? The answer is, it's foolish. That's all I'm going to tell you. It leads to debauchery. The word debauchery means extreme indulgence that results in the loss of control. And that's what we're talking about, letting someone else take the wheel. And that can be alcohol. It can be lust. It can be greed. It can be anger. It can be stuff or food. And we need guardrails to keep us from getting to the place where we hand over control to someone or something else. The next part of verse 18 says this. Paul says, Instead, instead of debauchery, instead of drunkenness, instead be filled with the Spirit. And God wants to play that role for you. So as you reach for the remote, head to the fridge, text her back, order that second drink, you bump into a guardrail. And he whispers in your conscience, "Uh -uh uh-uh-uh, come on, man. I thought we talked about this. This year, you said you were not going to eat two whole pizzas, okay? That's 16 slices of pizza. You've already had eight. Don't do the ninth one. Leave that pizza for tomorrow. Like, who knows? Maybe I'm just talking from my own personal experience. I really like pizza. Sometimes it's a problem. But I want you to realize this very sobering fact. It's that no one plans to mess up their lives. You know, no one plans to wreck their car. We just don't plan not to. Nobody plans financial ruin. Nobody plans to get evicted. No one plans to lose their car because they can't pay for it. Nobody plans a violent marriage. No one ever goes, oh, I'm so excited to get married. Y'all, ha- y'all better wait. This is going to be one for the history books. The worst marriage of all time. What an exciting thing. I'm going to be the worst husband anyone's ever seen. I'm going to be vicious to my wife constantly. No one ever wakes up with the plan of being a horrible spouse. No one ever plans to get involved with someone who's married. No one ever plans to fall in love with someone who abuses them and mistreats them. And no one certainly ever plans to get addicted to alcohol or to drugs or to cigarettes. Nobody plans for these things. Guardrails are how you plan not to. So please, don't insult yourself by saying things like, I have faith that God will take care of me. He's trying, and you are here today because he brought you here to listen to this. And God is encouraging you to set up guardrails in your life. It's not the first time you've been warned, and it's probably not the first time that you flirted with disaster and justified it away in your heart. So don't say, I'll be careful. This is how you be careful. Scripture tells us that the heart of man is deceitful and wicked above all things. Who can understand it? So if your spiritual walk through life is like a car, okay, and your heart is the one behind the wheel, you can't trust your heart to be careful. You need guardrails. Your heart and your inclination are to sin. That's just part of who we are as human beings. We need guardrails. We can pray through it. Yeah. We can try to pray it away. But it doesn't hurt to just have some common sense. Establish boundaries. Establish parameters for your behavior. Establish guardrails in your life. And the added benefit of this is that, yes, guardrails protect us from something on the other side that would have been much worse than hitting the guardrail, but they also direct us. They protect and direct. And you will find it so much easier to discern the voice of the Lord in your life when you establish guardrails. You would be 
amazed. In the weeks to come, we're touching on friends, money, marriage, the like. But as we conclude, I want to ask you a question. You know, at the beginning of the sermon, I told you guardrails are personal boundaries you need to set for yourself. This series is not going to change your life unless you take a hard look at yourself. You need to ask yourself a question. What do you need to face up to today? Where are you flirting with disaster? How have you justified blowing past the white line, flying off the road? That's where you need to begin because God brought you here for a reason. And he's not kidding around. He wants to help you. He wants to protect you. He wants you to take care of yourself. And I know you're thinking of something. It's time to face up to the problem. I know you're thinking of something. I am too. It's okay. That's why we're here. I want to encourage you to come back here next Sunday, whether online or in person. I want you to come back here next Sunday and the Sunday after that so that we can work together to protect our own hearts. No one else is going to build your guardrails for you. So listen, if this is your first time joining us, we would love to talk to you. Go to our website, hit the connect tab, follow the prompts. We want to talk with you. We want to put resources in your hands And God, you know, in this life, we should not be walking with Jesus alone. God designed you for community. And God designed his church so that you would be supported and encouraged in the faith. Even if you've been joining us for years, please, you're our spiritual family. We want to hear from you. Comment on this video and go to our website. Men of Church, I love you so much. I, I want to thank you for joining us today. If you've made it to this point, I want you to know that God loves you. He is proud of you, and he's working in your life. Even when you don't see it, God is still working for you and in you and all around you. I cannot wait to see y'all next week as we continue this amazing series. God bless you. And now I know that this is the good